Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to this afternoon's presentation by uh, Keith Allred on combating human trafficking. And I'll take the, my name is David Kirkham and uh, teach a course in political science and ethics and international affairs. And uh, that's why one of the main reasons that we've brought Captain Allred to be with us today. But I'd like us to start by uh, inviting Andrew Lindsay to offer an opening prayer after which I'll, in, I'll introduce uh, Captain Allred more formally. Our dear, kind, and gracious Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this opportunity that we have to gather here together and to listen to the message that our presenters prepared for us today and to learn from it and to apply it and try and find real, real solutions to these problems in the world. And Father, we thank Thee. We're thankful for Thy Spirit. We say these things in the name of Thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm very pleased to see that there are many people here who are not from my class. As a matter of fact, I hope all my class is here and that they just didn't forget and they're sitting over there in the marb somewhere. But uh, one of the things that really pleases me that there are a couple of you that were from this class last year and didn't even know that uh, this was in conjunction with the international ethics course. And so I'm pleased that you've showing enough interest in these issues, a lasting interest to, to be here today. Uh, Captain Allred, he's now retired captain, very recently, just as of December, retired of the U.S. Navy. Uh, he and I have known each other for several years now and become very, very good friends. We taught together at the George C. Marshall European Center for Security Studies in southern Germany. And he was a professor of international law. I was a professor of international politics. We had a lot of similar interests, as well as both being the uh, only Latter-day Saints that were on the faculty there and perhaps... There may, there may be uh, Todd Brown, I guess, may have been the only other one who ever served there to our knowledge. And so this was uh, a great introduction to each other. And I remember one day that, w that we started talking about human trafficking issues. And we were, it was something that was uh, disturbing to both of us, interesting to both of us, and uh, something I've pursued a little bit, but that he pursued m further. He's done some publications on this, and most recently, acted as a consultant to the OSCE in Europe, uh, the Organization for Security Cooperation in Europe, as uh, on human trafficking and has helped them do some work. So I'm looking forward very much to hearing what he says, and what uh, his thoughts, how they've developed uh, over the years, the intervening years. Uh, the only other thing we've done together on that is saw that movie, didn't we? We took our wives to, <laughs> I, forgot, I forgot the name of it. Anyway. Those of you who are my students uh, will know, or have been my students, that the only thing better than a good movie clip is a real life person who has some experience on this. So, uh, Captain Allred has been a senior trial judge in the Navy, was uh, beginning in 2005 up until, as I said, just very recently when he retired. Uh, his distinction, did, did anybody come hear him yesterday, speak yesterday? A couple of you, okay, so we're, we're drawing a slightly different crowd, but his distinction really is that he presided over the first American war crimes tribunal or trial since Nuremberg down in Guantanamo when he was responsible for trying Saddam, um, Obama. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought I'd do that. I never thought, Osama bin Laden's driver. You got it right, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought I'd do that. Um, anyway, to totally deprive you of the distinction that this man brings, I, I mess up like that. But he's also been a fellow for a couple of years now at the International Center for Law and Religion Studies, which is uh, my main occupation right now at the law school, where we work throughout the world to promote religious uh, freedom th and uh, and I mentioned his work at the Marshall Center. He was also associate dean at the Marshall Center. His uh, military career has been quite distinguished. He served as commanding officer at the U.S. Trial Service Office Euro in Europe and Southwest Asia in Naples. Not sure what Southwest Asia, wa Asia was doing in Naples, but uh, the Army, or I mean the Air, I'm tired today. <laughs> He's promised to keep me awake. The military arranges these things in strange ways sometimes. 
He's been a circuit trial judge uh, in the Western Pacific Judicial Circuit, uh, in, which was in Japan, an executive, op executive officer at the Naval Legal Service Office in uh, San Diego, and a general counsel at the Naval Medical Center in San Diego as well. He uh, holds a lot of degrees. He received his bachelor's degree here from BYU, graduating with high honors. He also has uh, a law degree from the University of Washington, uh, an MBA from uh, Moorhead State, um, an, an ML, that's a, is that? LLM. An LLM, okay. So a master of law degree in healthcare law from DePaul University, MA in national security affairs. Um, from the U.S. Naval War College. He's also a graduate of the National Judicial College in Reno, Nevada, and of the U.S. Army Judge Advocate General School. You can see that there's so much of that, that's why I had to read it, even though he is an excellent friend, someone whose friendship I cherish, and uh, a man that I, I really like and admire. So turn the time over to Captain Ulrich. Thank you very much. It's always a little accomplishments of a lifetime, right? Let me just tell you a story so you don't get too much fun. I did actually graduate from BYU, and I did graduate with high honors, but I almost didn't graduate at all. <laughs> because when I went to uh, do a graduation application, you know, apply for graduation, you know, they sit there, talk to what's your point, and they say, I'm sorry, but you don't have enough credits. And to that I had managed to take Dr. Southern's part two So embarrassing. <laughs> so I uh, did what many of you have done. Oh, well, the graduation office decided that since I had taken a course of two different professors, they would count it as two religious classes. So just to understand the word of that, so I said two professors of religion. So I guess one is one way to live. So I went over to the Spanish. Well, okay. I, I hadn't I hadn't planned to just I, just stand here at the podium, but I want to show I want to show you now a little bit of video clip. This is an interview of a woman who was just in for the first time, and I want you to look at that how she got this job, and then we'll talk about her later on. Thank you. 
Okay, well, we'll see, we'll see the video in a minute. Let's turn. Um, how many of you are already familiar with that? Bug? Yes. Can I try it? Tatiana wanted to work in Western Europe, too. She left her home in Moldova on what she thought was a dream journey west with her boyfriend. For her safety, we had concealed her identity. He'd been a few times at my parents and my, even my mother liked him. And then he started uh, bragging out to her, you, maybe you, we can go together to work in our uh, future and maybe to work in West Europe. Yes, I told him to my parents about it. I have some uh, plans to leave the country. They, uh, they already became quite against to this. My mother, she was carrying my small brochure that there is something about trafficking. She said, in case of something, because every mother will uh, worry about something. She said, it could happen everything. Maybe on the road, somebody will uh, take you or whatever. Just have with you this number. I just threw away and I got angry uh, on her. But why? She just came. Why? She never trusts me. Tatiana traveled to Amsterdam, convinced she would be protected by her loving boyfriend. For the moment, I just wanted to enjoy the trip. She was quiet, very quiet. Here we arrive, and there's waiting a guy. I think it's his friend, and they just go together a little bit uh, further. And then came just the other guy and just said to me, we get to the flat where you will stay. And we just asked, where is my boyfriend? Oh, don't worry, he'll come back. He just have to go somewhere and then he will come back at the flat too. Okay. When we go in at that flat, the guy starts to explain me so that you didn't just sell it and you have to work for me to work in prostitution. I had a kept panic and I started to scream. Tatiana's boyfriend, who she had been with for six months, had just sold her to a pimp. And when I realized what happened, what it was my, my boyfriend, I just hate him. I, I don't know, I trust him more than my mother. And that person who'd been so nice for half year, and I know him so good, just changed and just realized that it was just acting and just it was, he did just his job. Alina runs a hotline in Moldova for women seeking advice about working abroad. According to her, traffickers are clever and experienced in tricking their victims. So a lot of care is planned for the future. And for the sake of the person very good with her. And she says, yes, you can see it. It's your problem. You can have your faith in me. With her, everything will be in order. Once Tatiana had made the big mistake of trusting her boyfriend, there was no way out. And he said, don't forget it. We know where your parents live. We know everything about your sister. And so he said, what do you think it would be maybe better to take one of your sister that will pay for your uh, mistake? And I didn't know what to do. To crawl, to don't crawl. What? To run away. To don't run away. Tatiana spent six months as a sex slave in Amsterdam. And the same thing is happening right now to thousands and thousands of other women. There is no corner of the world unaffected by the tragedy of trafficking. Wherever you are, there are young women suffering like Tatiana. But it is not only traffickers and pimps who are to blame. It is also men who pay for sex, including young men, some who might be watching this documentary, or maybe guys you know. Join me after the break to find out why they share the blame and what you can do to help end exploitation and trafficking. Okay, um, of course it's not only women who are trafficked. It's not only for sex, for the sex industry. Trafficking in persons is a global business venture of organized crime uh, that nets them billions and billions of dollars every year. There are strong economic incentives that drive people into situations where they are trafficked. Those are usually uh, poor economic conditions at home and a desire for a better life somewhere else. They want to go to Western Europe. They want to go to the United States. 
They want to go to a place where the economy is strong and they have hopes that they can get a job, a nice job, even as a, a waitress or a custodian or a hotel cleaner or something very basic. For many people in uh, Eastern Europe, these are strong, attractive jobs. And they're enough to entice people to, to go in hopes of getting one and making a better life for themselves. The last time I was in uh, Bogota, I found, I was surprised to find some life-size cutouts. You know, the cardboard kind of people who stand in the airport. There was a good-looking young man, and there was a nice-looking young woman, and there was a little sign there attached to their bodies that said, have you arranged for a job overseas? Are you sure that it's legitimate? Why don't you stop by the office uh, before you go and talk to us uh, before you get on the plane? And many people are trafficked um, after they arrive. This girl, Tatiana, thought she was in the hands of someone she loved and that they were going together to make a better life in Amsterdam, only to find out that this guy had been working her for months, probably went right back and brought the next girl that was also his girlfriend and he'd been working her for several months. Now, I apologize if anyone's of offended by the fact that sex trafficking is a major part of the trafficking problem. But there are others. Uh, people are trafficked to, to work in the agriculture industry. The southern United States, the central and southeastern United States, anywhere where large demands for labor to work in the fields, to work in the trees and the groves and the plantations, is a tempting place for men, usually, to be trafficked. Um, where I live in Southern California, vans of undocumented aliens come across the border. They try to escape from the Border Patrol. Many times they do, and sometimes they don't. But when they're caught, when the van rolls or when it's pulled over, no one will ever say, this guy was the driver. They all just say, hey, we were on our way north. We don't know who was escorting us. And they all get repatriated. The driver, the trafficker, is protected from criminal prosecution because the people that he was trafficking are afraid to identify him. And many times that is a problem, is that trafficking victims are unwilling to testify against or identify those who have trafficked them. Uh, garment, the garment industry, sweatshops, is another draw for trafficked people. It requires labor, and it's a labor-intensive industry. One of our most successful prosecutions in the United States in the last several years was of a sweatshop. And I'll tell you about it in a few minutes. 200 Koreans and Chinese were, were freed from slavery and servitude. And they weren't working in the sex industry. They were just sewing your blue jeans uh, or, or some other article of clothing. Uh, the sex industry is a great demand for trafficking, especially for women and girls, but also for young boys. And uh, I think the figure is 40 or 50 percent of those who are trafficked are trafficked to work in some kind of sexual uh, trade or business, whether it's prostitution, table dancing, uh, massage parlors, or other kinds of sexually related industries. Um, domestic servants, child care, daycare, and domestic help in the kitchen and around the house. Sometimes those people are another those trades are another place where trafficked victims end up. Food services, and finally construction. Um, it's the demand for cheap labor, on the one hand, that's driving the need for cheap labor. And it's the desire for a better life, on the other hand, that brings this labor like a constant influx towards Western, industrialized, and successful countries. So. Naturally, the countries of the world are divided into the destination countries where everyone wants to end up, the source or origin countries where the, the poor and the underprivileged tend to originate, and then there are transit countries where they pass through and, and sometimes are trafficked or work in the sex industry or some other industry on the way to another destination. Because once they've been trafficked, once this Tatiana had been sold to the trafficker, that's not the end of her journey. Sometimes he'll work her or have her work for him for a few months and sell her to someone else. 
who will sell her to someone else. It's literally a modern day slave trade. Uh, although people aren't brought across the Atlantic in ships chained to uh, you know, metal posts. They're moved between countries, they're sold, and they're kept in conditions that prevent them from escaping. Now, our response to this is obviously a multifaceted response, one element of which is criminal prosecutions. Um, that's a dicey proposition. Part of the reason for that is what I just explained to you. Victims are often reluctant to testify. They're afraid of law enforcement. Why would they be afraid of law enforcement? Corruption's a possibility. Well, they're illegally in the country is another reason. They are illegal aliens. And they're afraid of deportation. They're afraid of prosecution themselves for having crossed the border without permission and not having had a visa. Many times because of language difficulties, they don't know what to do or who to turn to or how to solve their problems. And so they seem to avoid law enforcement. Or once they've been rescued, they're afraid of law enforcement. Another reason for their fear is these threats that have been made to them. We know where your sister lives. We know your, where your mom and dad are. If you get away, we'll go get one of them. And so th they're trying to protect people back home by not identifying the trafficker, testifying against him, uh, and cooperating in a successful prosecution. This trafficking in persons industry spawns a whole array of other criminal violations that includes things like tax evasion, money laundering, fa false and fraudulent document printing and distribution, wire fraud, bribery of officials. Who said corru corruption a while ago? Yeah, corruption. In many countries, a bribe to an official is an important part of getting someone out of the country without a passport, into the country without a visa, these kinds of things. And so this phenomenon of human trafficking is the exclusive province, the near exclusive province of international organized crime. Many of these gangs are violent and, uh, and that adds another layer of complexity to the mix. Now let me tell you about the, the largest uh, U.S. prosecution up to a few years ago, this um, sweatshop. The, the defendant was named uh, Kil Su Lee, a Korean sweatshop owner. I think this is a woman. She had uh, 250 employees that had been trafficked. Um, they were paid little or nothing. They were threatened with harm. They were kept in conditions that equaled imprisonment or confinement. They were threatened and abused. The threats included jail or deportation because they were illegally in the country. And it wasn't until law enforcement was able to break in and rescue these people that they finally uh, got them out of this sweatshop. They could have stayed there for years. Kil Soon Lee uh, was convicted and two others were convicted. 200 people liberated. Now, these are difficult cases to prosecute. We're still talking about the criminal approach to trafficking, the criminal response to human trafficking. Um, when, I mean, first of all, the police have to uh, find these hidden locations where trafficked people are being kept. Um, the clues to that could be traf you know, foot traffic to and from a place. Uh, conditions that sh seem unnecessarily secure for the neighborhood, like barbed wire fence around the, the, the building, um, or some kind of tip. But it takes a lot of police and detective work to find these people and start investigating, building the case, getting the search warrant, and uh, getting to the point where you can rescue them. Um, in the five-year period between 2000 and 2004, the U.S. attorneys throughout the United States prosecuted 170 trafficking cases. Does that sound like a lot to you? About 30 a year? I don't think, I don't think so. They're estimated to be 15 to 20,000 trafficked persons in the United States. And um, up to 10 or 12 million worldwide. Six to 800,000 a year are trafficked, according to the estimates of various international organizations. And so, the fact that the U.S. attorneys were able to free a few hundred victims and prosecute a 
100 or so defendants, uh, shows how difficult these cases are to, to investigate, to build a case, and to prove. One of the challenges of criminal, the criminal response to trafficking of, uh, trafficking, of course, is that you have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. It's a high standard. You have to have good evidence to get a conviction. And when you have victims who don't want to talk, don't want to testify, don't want to uh, hazard the safety of their friends and family back home, these present tremendous law enforcement challenges. Um, when victims are rescued from a trafficking kind of scenario, of course they're afraid. They're afraid of the police. They're afraid of because they're I illegally in the country. They're afraid of their traffickers. And so to have a successful prosecution and have a successful response to, to trafficking, you need law enforcement people that include, you know, women who are victims assistance kind of helpers, social services agencies, interpreters and translators who can speak to these people, men or women, boys or girls, in their language, who understand their cultures and the backgrounds they come from, so that the, so that the police can begin to build a rapport with these victims and gain their trust. They need a place to live. They need food. I mean, they got nothing. They've just been rescued from some brothel or trailer where they used to work on the farm. And so, so we need a, a system for, like you do for domestic violence victims, a, a safe house where they can live, be safe, be clean, shower, have some fresh clothes. We need medical attention for them. You know, whether they're, if they're sex trafficking victims, they need to be checked for venereal diseases, other injuries they might have sustained in the course of having sex 10 or 20 times a day for six months. And venereal diseases, pregnancy, uh, STDs, those kinds of things. All of that organization has to be in place to successfully respond to traf a, a trafficked victim. Now, the prosecutors also want to build a case. They want evidence. They know they're going to have to go into the courtroom and prove that this guy was the trafficker. And so not only do they need the cooperation of the victim, let's, let's say Tatiana. Let's try Tatiana's case. We've got to persuade Tatiana to testify and say, this is the guy who met me at the train station. And I remember that my boyfriend walked over and talked to him. He t I'm sorry, I'm pointing at you. You're a lady, but... He took me to the flat. He said I was going to have to work in prostitution. When I said no, he raped me and beat me and locked me there for a week. I mean, you have to have detailed testimony from these victims to have a successful prosecution. Um, one of the elements of the offense uh, under the federal statute is that this forced uh, servitude was accomplished by fraud, coercion, or threats. And so the police have to get the victim to test it, to, to tell them in detail exactly what the threat was, exactly what the fraud was, or you know how, how they were uh, de deceived. But then we got to have other things. Do you know what it means to corroborate the testimony? I'm sure you do. Every little detail of what she says, the more corroboration or support we can get for that, the more likely the jury is to believe her and to find the trafficker guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. So we're looking for uh, business cards, evidence of patrons coming to the establishment and paying money, neighbors who saw people coming, men coming and going at all hours of the night, um, escape attempts by the victim, medical care she may have received, um, guns, photos, visas, I mean anything that supports and substantiates her story, the prosecutors are trying to find. Sometimes they have these places under surveillance and there will be photographs. Um, and I'll show you in a minute a case of a Lithuanian girl where they built this kind of case, but it took months. And meanwhile, she's being raped every day in the room by uh, the patrons who came to this brothel. Okay, um, matter of fact, let's do that now. Can we figure out how to do, can we make this computer go again? We will do this. This, this is a presentation that was made by a, a, a gentleman from Scotland Yard several years ago. He built in Alberta, and she's a Lithuanian. I, 
And there's the, there's the guy's name, Mark Wolbert. This is his name with Julia. But I want to show you her story. This girl is a 16-year-old girl who disappeared from her home one day in Lithuania. Oh, I'm sorry. I've got to turn on the... Got to work on my instruction and techniques here. Do you see that now? Roberta. This is her passport picture. Okay, can you imagine you're Roberta's mom and dad and she just doesn't come home from school one day? And that's, I mean, we, we just went through this in Southern California. The girl was found murdered in a local lake. Roberta just, there was nothing. There was nothing and she was gone. And the clue that allowed her parents to locate her was that somehow she had managed to put her ATM card in an ATM somewhere, and they realized that it had been used in London. And so they called the police and said, our daughter's missing, her ATM card has been used in London. And um, the, the British police began an investigation. London's a big city to look for a 16-year-old girl in. So. They started looking in the brothel areas. They suspected human trafficking. They um, contacted the Lithuanian embassy and got their investigation going. But, but, but they had to find out, they had to get a picture of her. What does this girl look like? Um, and then they started surveillance of these various brothels. three months. I mean, here she is being ravished every day for three months, and they're out there taking pictures looking for wh where she is. What more can you do? She is in some brothel in a bedroom, and it's behind closed doors. So part of what they did is test purchase visits. I mean, I guess they had guys go into the brothel with money and say, I, I, wanna, I want Roberta, I want a Lithuanian girl, or wh whatever you do in the police world to try to figure out whether this girl is there or not. Test calls. Hey, you know, what are you doing over there? And these are being recorded. Yeah, we're running a little service here. And they're, they're building evidence. They're trying to get evidence for a search authorization and to break in. Controlled money introduced, looking for financial records from that venue to show how much money they're making and how often they're depositing it. This is tough. It's slow, hard police work. think they found out? Albanian organized crime. Um, 15 to 20 women. 300 pounds a day. That's about $600 a day for each woman. Isn't about two to one? That's a working number. It's six to $1,400 a day each woman is, is making in profits. You can see why this is such an attractive industry. There's money to be made. Um, Apple pickers and garment workers don't make as much as these sex slaves, but, uh, but they're still making money for people, and this is the drive for why people are trafficked. The fact that the, the premises are open 24 hours a day, that's uh, indicative of something, isn't it? Okay, these are the names of the bad guys. Failed asylum seekers or clandestine entrants from Albania. Albania is famous for its mob, its gangsters, its organized criminal activity. And what clandestine entrants means is illegal aliens. So they sneaked into the UK, Albanian mobsters, and they set up this human trafficking organization. Okay, so finally the police get to the point where they know where this girl is, and they've got their photographer across the street in a police vehicle watching the house. Okay, this is the day, uh, 8 February, where they finally see her being moved from one location to another. And some of these pictures are just going to be a little repetitive. That's one of the bad guys. There she is. This is Roberta. You can see the sad look on her face. She, notice her jacket her, and her piece of luggage there. Um, at the end of the case, they figured out how she got trafficked. It was a boyfriend who said, hey, let's catch a flight over to London, watch a soccer game. It'll be cool. We'll be back before mom and dad know. And another one of those scams, you know. Uh, but here she is being loaded into the vehicle. These are all the bad guys who uh, ultimately 
were identified. There's one of them holding her coat and standing with her luggage on the street in London as she's being sold to these guys. And gals. I don't know who that girl in the red hair is, but she's probably part of this package too. Okay, so these are covert surveillance pictures uh, from the police. Money changes hands. There's Roberta. Again, with a ugly looking guy having his arm around her. And the redhead girl is uh, pretty close to the action too. I don't know exactly how she fit in. So there you go. Roberta's been taken into this house. And they know where she is. They finally built enough evidence to conduct the arrest. 21 women were rescued, 35,000 pounds. Okay, now this is, this is the thing I was talking to you about earlier. What you do when you've liberated a trafficking victim from this industry. They have what they call the Victim Reception Center. This girl has been traumatized for three months as a forced prostitute. She's emotionally fragile. She's probably afraid. She's probably desperate. And all of those support services that I described for you earlier are located in this victim reception center. Interpreters, and I don't speak Lithuanian, sexual health doctor. Boy, she's been having a lot of sexual activity lately. Outreach workers, or these are the people that explain the British legal system that help her get a visa so she can stay in the country, that calm her fears about being jailed or deported herself, um, that they'll let her call her mom and dad, and uh, that try to obtain her testimony so she can, so the can prosecutors can build their case against the Albanian gangsters. And something to eat, that's nice too. Okay. Once again, the victim has to be made to feel safe. She has to trust the police that they can protect her, that they will have a successful prosecution, that these guys will go to jail and not be out looking for her again. She has to be able to identify the traffickers and say, yes, it wasn't that guy over there, it was this guy over here. Probably look at pictures and things like that. And they take special pr measures to protect their identity. I mean, the traffickers know that their place has been raided that all 21 of their girls or their victims were, were taken away. They don't know who's testifying against her. And, and part of the protection of the victims is to keep their identity to the extent possible from those they're testifying against. So they probably tell the court, this is Roberta from Lithuania. She's going to testify under the name of David, uh, whatever, you know, name they choose for her. Okay. Now, one of, one of the other issues with these trafficking victims when they're rescued is the prosecution takes a long time. I mean, it could take six months to a year to get the case to trial. If she's deported back to her home country, there goes your main witness. So in the United States, we have a special kind of visa called the T visa, trafficking victims visa, where we say, sorry you've been trafficked. We're glad you're safe now. Here's a visa you can stay in the United States for you know, three years, I think it is. Um, many of them say, well, I want to go home. I miss my mom and dad. I miss my little sister and my kids. So, you know, there's this tension between trying to keep them for the trial and make them comfortable until it happens. So we have another, in the United States, another kind of visa that allows their family, some members of their family, to come live with them here so they'll feel comfortable and at home until the prosecution is complete and then we send them back to the country from which they were trafficked. But it's a very, very complex set of s social service organizations that need to be in place to successfully prosecute um, a case against a trafficking victim. Uh, sometimes they're not able to find employment. I mean, she clearly doesn't want to go back to work in the sex industry. This girl, Roberta, was only 16 years old. So well, what's she gonna do? She should be in high school. So, uh, in the United States, we are trying, and obviously Great Britain is trying, to build this network of support services so that trafficked victims can be identified, rescued, you know, rehabilitated, you know, treated, warmed, loved, all these things you need to do to people who have come through traumatic and difficult experiences. Okay. Uh, I, th I think
think I, I think I told you how she got trafficked, didn't I? Her boyfriend said, hey, let's go see a soccer game in London. Did you say bribery earlier in the day? Who said bribery or corruption of officials? Maybe, maybe you said corruption. Yeah, this girl didn't have the right to travel documents to go to London. They had to bribe a border official to get her from Lithuania into the neighboring country, Estonia, I think it was, from which they were able to fly under this no visa kind of travel policy. But if it hadn't been for that corrupt official, she might have been saved. And so public corruption is also frequently um, a part of these trafficking kind of situations. Okay, I want to shift gears f for a moment now. You understand that people can be, can, traffic, can be trafficked into all of these industries. We've talked about two that were trafficked into the sex industry. That may be the most common. But um, I want to talk about another part of the trafficking problem that, that I've been working with uh, in the Navy for the last several years. In 2004, the, uh, the United Nations sent a peacekeeping mission to the Congo, where they'd had some civil war. And when a peacekeeping mission goes overseas, they, they go to different countries and they say, can you give us some British troops and can you give us some French troops and can we have some from Argentina and how about you guys down in whatever. And so, th so they have a hodgepodge of troops that get sent to the Congo to conduct their peacekeeping missions. Aha, suddenly there are 50,000 or so single men in this country that's damaged and ravaged by war. Many of the women have lost their husbands in a civil war or in, in, or in fighting, or they've been displaced. And so they're vulnerable. They have no obvious source of support. They're trying to find a way to feed their kids. And into this uh, melee arrive all of these young men. Well, there's, there's natural tension there. Um, in some cases, the reports from the Congo that surfaced were that the peacekeepers were raping the local civilians. In other cases, the local women would crawl through the fences and, and offer themselves a, in a sexual partner kind of way in exchange for a couple of bucks or a piece of banana or some kind of something to eat. And so this is another part of the problem of human, tra human trafficking for sexual purposes is that military forces that go on deployments create demand. W where there's demand, someone will try to supply the demand. And so many times women are trafficked into these places because troops have showed up there. Um, as it turns out in the Congo, the, the, the Secretary of General of the United S Nations was embarrassed at reports that his peacekeepers, who were supposed to be there protecting people, were raping them and sexually abusing the children, and even that they were you know, accepting gifts of sexual services in exchange for small amounts of money. That's terrible to take advantage of people who are desperate. In that way, it's, it's, it's a kind of sexual abuse that may not amount to rape, but it's inappropriate for, for uh, UN peacekeepers to be engaged in. Uh, in the Balkans, after the Balkan War, the same kind of thing happened. UN peacekeepers arrived, and women were trafficked to the Balkans from Eastern Europe, and they were put in these brothels just outside the gates of the military bases. So outside the gate of the U.S. base, the brothel was called, uh, you know, New York, New York. Outside the gate of the French base, it was called Gay Paris or something like that. And so each little base with its national contingent had a group of women trafficked there to be their sexual partners. Now, I think that many of those young men didn't realize what they were doing. They, I mean, they knew they were going to a prostitute. They knew they were paying for a sexual a service, but they didn't know, I think, that these women, A, had been kidnapped, B, were sexual slaves, or C, that they were funding organized crime by buying its services, which is trafficked women. So all these UN peacekeepers were putting money in the coffers of organized crime without realizing sometimes that they were patronizing and purchasing sexual services from women who were sex slaves. So let's give many of them the benefit of the doubt. As far as they knew, they were just paying for a prostitute and they didn't, you know, and she was, had chosen to be a prostitute. But there were other peacekeepers 
who knew what was going on. They knew that the women were not there of their own free will and knew that they were slaves. There were other peacekeepers who actively assisted in the trafficking of these women by transporting them in UN vehicles, giving them false documents, covering up their presence, lying to investigators, all these kinds of things. And once again, the United Nations is humiliated to have its troops involved in this conduct. Some of them even purchased a woman from a trafficker, 3,000 bucks, 4,000 bucks, I don't know, and kept them as a domestic, you know, they, they cooked, they cleaned, they were like a temporary wife. And they just stayed in the house all day, and when dad comes home from his work uh, in the Balkans, they slept together as a man and a wife might, but she was purchased and not free to leave. Now fortunately, both of these two incidents, the Congo and the Balkans, involved a small number of American troops. But in both cases, the UN peacekeepers who were there resisted investigations, deceived investigators, refused to testify, threatened investigators, and otherwise obstructed any official effort to stop this from happening. I mean, there's in the past there's been kind of an attitude that boys will be boys. And that means, hey, you got single guys here, they need girls to have sex with, and that's the way it's gotta be. So why are you getting all uptight about the fact that these women are here? Um, others didn't really, weren't quite that crass about it, they, but they just said, you know, come on, what do you want me to do? I got 10,000 guys here, they got no basketball courts, no uh, video games, no movie theaters. They just carry their guns around all day and protect the people. And at night, they want to have some fun. They want to go have a beer. And they want to you know, play pool or shoot darts or whatever they do at home in the club. And they want girls to be there. And it was hard. I mean, it's hard to break that mindset. But in fact, many of these women are trafficked there against their will. Now, the U.S. Army had its own embarrassing kind of situation about the same time, the early last decade, about 10 years ago. You know, we have a large contingent of troops in South Korea. Um, there is still literally a war, I think, uh, going on in Korea. The, the armistice hasn't been signed or whatever it is. So there's a lot of American troops there. Well, there was this local television station in Ohio that noticed a large number of Korean massage parlors in Ohio. And they're going, what is up with this? Why, how come the Koreans are coming to Ohio for their massage? Well, the next thing you know, there's a television camera crew in Seoul, and they're walking around investigating the red light district of Seoul, trying to make some kind of a local interest story. And they come to, to this place where the Army, U.S. Army, military police are standing there with their MP you know, thing, the army uniform, and there it's night, and they're standing outside this brothel. And um, the interviewer had a hidden camera, you know, in, inside their bag or something. So they're showing this army soldier standing outside the brothel, and the questions were like, hey, what are you guys doing here? Oh, we're providing security. Well, what goes on inside? Ah, there's a bunch of girls in there, guys getting drunk, that kind of thing. Well, what can you tell us about the girls? Ah, they're from Russia, Georgia, Ukraine, those kind of things. Uh, they bring them here, they take away their passports, and they just keep them keep them in there working until they, they earn enough money to go home or something. Oh, yeah? And you're providing security for these guys? Yeah. Come on, I'll show you around. And, you know, this kind of thing. So, so that when this television program aired in the United States, it was like a black eye. The U.S. Army appeared to be supporting or facilitating or engaged in a business that involved traffic in women. We were guarding the place where the organized criminals were selling these trafficked women. And it caused a great outrage. So um, between the various UN embarrassments, our embarrassment in South Korea, a movement began about 10 years ago to try to reform armed forces when they're abroad on military missions. And um, Part of that movement involves something as simple as training. I mean, if, if you get a bunch of people and say, look, you're about to deploy to the Balkans. 
if you find a brothel there, there's a good chance those women are trafficked. They're sex slaves. They're not free to go. Their passports have been taken away, and they'll get beat up if they try to run away. Do you really want to go in there and spend your money? I mean, supporting that activity? And so, so we've tried to help our soldiers and sailors understand that it's not just a brothel where a woman has decided to make her money this way. It's, it's organized criminal activity, and you are buying their product. So that's part of the, that's part of the solution. Every military person who reports to duty in Korea now, whether it's the, the soldier himself, his wife or husband, the kids, the civilian contractors, and anybody who goes to Korea is told about human trafficking. Is told that there are places in Korea where trafficked women are present and that those places are off limits. So whole sections of the town sometimes are declared off limits to U.S. military perso personnel. You can't go there. And now the military police drive around there picking you up if you're there because you are in an off-limits area. And so this same idea has been suggested for the United Nations peacekeepers who go abroad. Um, you know, the Ulala La Cafe is off-limits. The New York, New York Cafe, off-limits. If the military police find you there, they will bring you home. Well, this is a problem. You know, international organizations have lots of different rules. Each country has its own discipline system, its own standards of uh, conduct, its own expectations of its troops. And so uh, sometimes you get in uneven, inadequate enforcement of these standards of conduct, kind of um, off-limits areas. But, but, the, but the trend is in that direction. Pre-deployment training, off-limits areas, regular patrols to enforce the off-limits areas. And, um, and then the other idea that, that everyone is experimenting with to try to improve the conduct of peacekeepers when they're deployed is codes of conduct. Codes of conduct. I mean, we tell them, look, we expect you to conduct yourselves on deployment with the highest possible standards. We're not going to tolerate goofing off, abusing the local population. And so each country or each organization has its own code of conduct or zero tolerance policy. NATO has a zero tolerance policy that is very express and clear. And it says, uh, we will not tolerate any engagement in or facilitation of or support for human trafficking. The um, UN's code of conduct is much more vague. It says we expect you to be on your best behavior and show respect for the local population and you know be a good soldier. So there's a there's a movement abroad a afoot to discipline troops when they deploy a lot more uh, um, to hold them to a much higher standard and so that so that women are not trafficked to the place where the where the soldiers are performing their duties in order for them to, uh, to have uh, sexual partners. Now let's see if I can show you here. A couple of the things we use to train our troops in South Korea. This is where all kinds of buttons are pulled. Are you looking okay? Okay. This, this looks like it might work. I'm sorry about the... Oh, no. <laughs> okay, so now, y you may not know this. When, when our forces go overseas, we have military bases, of course, and we have something called Armed Forces Television. And as part of our agreement with the nation that we're sending our troops to, they allow us to broadcast American movies and American cartoons and cooking <coughs> shows and all that stuff, so the troops will have stuff to watch. I mean, you, you can't watch TV in Korean if you don't speak Korean. And so as part of our welfare and recreation treaty, they allow us to have armed forces television in foreign countries. These are little advertisements because armed forces television can't play regular advertisements for, you know, products. They, they have all these public service announcements, and, that, and that's what these are. Let's see if we can show you a couple. I don't think they catch on. I think this is kind of a
So you guys have closed, you have forces of three, right? That's that's their hotline you can call uh, if you see signs that someone may have been attacked. Okay, I'm sorry, I don't know why the I don't know why the volume isn't quite. This is their commanding general saying, You guys listen up. Trafficking is unacceptable. We are not going to allow you to participate in it or support it. Oh, what is he doing? He's, um, he's uh, too many buttons. Sorry, yeah. Okay, now we've got him. Okay, once again, this is, this is part of our effort to uh, train our troops. Fortunately, these have captions on them, and, and you uh, you can see what they what these people are doing. You know, if you ask me, that's kind of scary. The thought of actually rescuing someone from, from a place where mean men are working. But, uh, but we're trying to get our troops to be aware that women are trafficked, and they're trafficked by violent, angry international criminals, and that the conditions under which they're held are terrible and abusive, and that we shouldn't be any part of it. Okay, the last thing I wanted to... Um, talk to you about is some new initiatives that we've developed in the United States to prosecute these people. Um, sometimes you cannot get the victim to testify, I mentioned that earlier, or you can't build an adequate case. So we've come up with a new offense, um, and the offense is document servitude. Okay, so, so the highest and the most serious offense we might charge a trafficker with would be called involuntary servitude under 18 U.S. Code 1584. That requires proof that the person was in compelled to perform some period, some kind of service, whether it be agricultural, sexual, you know, labor in a sweatshop or a restaurant or whatever, that it was for some period of time, a day, a week, a month, and that, it, that it w the person was forced to perform that service with force or threats. So this is important. The victim has got to be able to recount the force or threats that compelled the servitude, or the prosecution fails. We're not going to get a conviction without a cooperative victim who will describe the service and the, and the force or threats. And then it must have been knowing or willfully done. 20 years is the maximum punishment for those convicted of this offense. If a person was killed in the course of the servitude or raped, I think life imprisonment is the maximum. But once again, sometimes we don't have victims who want to cooperate with the prosecution, or they're afraid, or they want to go home. And so, we have document servitude. What, what this means is that if, if the police raid the premises and find that the owner or the custodian has someone else's passport in his office, that's a crime. That's good for five years. You see what I'm saying? Without the cooperation now of the victim, we can say, hey, you took someone else's passport away. You prevented them from leaving. And so we're going to prosecute you for that. It's, it's like, like Al Capone was ultimately convicted on tax evasion instead of all the bad stuff he did. It's a way to convict these uh, uh, traffickers of some offense, even if the victims are afraid or unwilling to cooperate in a more full-fledged prosecution. There's a number of other criminal uh, offenses that are out there. The, the punishments range from five to 20 years to life. And uh, the United States is committed um, to protecting victims of human trafficking. Uh, now I want, you to I want you to tell me, what could have been done to prevent Tatiana from being trafficked? The girl whose story we featured at the beginning. Probably nothing, right? I mean, her mom gave her the pamphlet. Her mom gave her the number. Her mom said, traffickers are out there. Be careful. Are you sure this is what you want to do? She wouldn't be warned. She wanted to go to the West and get a good job. 
um, what could have been done to p protect Roberta? Well, a corrupt official could have done his job. Um, but otherwise, I mean, she didn't, real she didn't see what was coming. She thought she was going to a soccer game. Now, even uh, I'll, I'll, we'll have time for questions or comments in a minute if you want to. We have to wrap up a quarter to six. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, well, we'll have like a little discussion here in a couple of minutes, and uh, anyone who wants to leave, you're welcome to do that. Roberta, I mean, she didn't know what she was getting into. She, she thought, thought she was going to a game. Even within the United States, a large number of young kids fall into trafficking. They're kids that run away from home. They're kids that get a boyfriend or, or start hanging out with older men or something and find that they're being asked to perform sexual favors first for their boyfriend, then for his friends, and then the next thing you know, they're working at a truck stop or something. So we have some prevention efforts, both in the military and in the civilian community. They're educational. They're warning. They're like, don't talk to strangers kind of things. Don't, you know, don't run away from home. Tell your mom and dad where you're going and, and those kinds of things. Um, but to a certain extent, uh, other than education, you have almost overwhelming forces. You have this tremendous demand for sex, for farm workers, for garment workers, for, for domestic workers, for all these kinds of workers in rich countries that have money and they want low-cost products. And then you in, in the lower paid countries, you have a tremendous demand for a better lifestyle. These people want to improve themselves. And so these things like magnets are pulling towards each other. And it's difficult to prevent them sometimes from doing it, even with a warning, like the one I described in the airport in, in Colombia, or like Tatiana's mom tried to give her. So with that, I'll wrap up my remarks and open it up for questions or comments. This lady had a, her hand in the air a moment ago. Do, did you want to offer something? Yeah, I mean, it is a terrible thing to say. And poor Tatiana, if, if someone had said, just because you know someone, she would have said, I've known this guy for six months. He's my boyfriend. And you heard her say, I trust him more than I trust my mother. I thought she was just an old poop telling me to worry about trafficking and stuff. I, I, you know, many times these, these victims, once they're rescued and repatriated to their country, the traffickers don't care. You know, she's used goods. They'll just go get another one the same way. Unless they're caught and prosecuted and put in jail, this is a business cycle. When you've worn out one of your laborers, when the guy on the farm gets a bad back, you turn him loose and you go get another guy, another Mexican or Guatemalan who's looking for a job. Okay, other comments or questions? Yes, ma'am. What about the best organizations? The best organizations? I, I don't know what the best organizations are. There's a, a number um, that are working on If you just Google human trafficking, you'll find that the UN, that the NATO, that uh, you know, organizations with human trafficking in their name, a lot of people are trying to stop this from happening. This is the second most lucrative trade for organized crime after drugs. I mean, that's, there's a lot of money in this, and uh, a lot of people are trying to stop it. One of the requirements, let me just tell you one thing we're doing. When, when people living in foreign countries want a visa to visit the United States, they have to apply for a visa. They have to go to a U.S. embassy in the country they live in and be interviewed by a consular officer who's going to make sure they're eligible for a visa, that they're going to come back, that their reason for going is valid and stuff like that. We now have a pamphlet that the cons consular officers are required to give people that's, that talks about trafficking and the number to call and the fact that this is going on, and, and if, the, if the person hasn't read the pamphlet, the consular officer has to explain it to them to make sure that they're aware that they might be entering into some kind of trafficking scenario. Was there a question back here? I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead.
good question. What do you think we could do to cut down the demand for sexual services? Well, in the, in the troop context, training them, prohibiting them from going to the places where the services are being offered, these are some of the efforts to cut down the demand. You know, I in the United States, prostitution is already illegal. So we've done what we can, I, I guess, there to keep people from being prostitutes. What, what do you guys think? What could we do to stop the demand for... I we could stop buying orange juice. I bet there are people out there picking oranges that have been trafficked. We could stop buying Persian rugs. I had somebody come to my house in Italy once and harass me because I uh, had some Persian rugs, and she says, Th those are made with child labor. Okay. I don't know. I mean, these are good questions. Do you have an, uh, a suggestion? The United States does that. Our federal statutes allow us to seize the assets of those who are convicted of, of trafficking. But, but once again, you have to convict them. You've got to have all this evidence and prove it beyond a reasonable doubt to get a conviction. Well, will you Good question. I, it's a great idea. My experience, I mean, they have, they've, they've got a black eye in Korea. I think they're very aggressive in Korea because they, were, they had this television show broadcast about them. Other th I, I've never received the training in the Navy in 30 years. I mean, if, if I hadn't been interested in human trafficking, I wouldn't know. I mean, I think it's mandatory that you go some kind of lecture every year on human trafficking, but I don't know that it's aggressively worked. Um, as, as it should be. Did you ever see those in Europe, though? No, but I'm thinking that, you know, even now, I'm sure the same idea that the psychiatrist is that this is a treatment for them, right? Well, we hope so. I mean, th th there is a de Department of Defense program to prevent human trafficking and, and to prevent our forces from being involved in human trafficking. So each of the services should have an education program. Each of the services should be training its troops. But you, I mean, unless you have someone who passionately believes in this, sometimes the troops probably just don't get it. Yes, ma'am. I'll, I'll tell you what I think the answer is. The United States, I mean, the United Nations is, is a beggar when it comes to peacekeeping operations. They have got money, and you, the nations of the world, have troops. Now, it, it's kind of an economic argument, too. If you go to a place like Bangladesh, they pay their soldiers, let's say, $100 a month. The UN pays $1,000 a month to get a peacekeeper. So the Bangladeshis can send one of their troops on a peacekeeping mission, get $1,000 from the UN, pay their soldier 100 bucks, and they make money on the deal. American troops cost, you know, let's take 2,000, 3,000 a month. So we're losing money on any troops we provide to the UN. The, the consequence of this is that you tend to get, I think, troops from developing countries, less well-disciplined, less well-prepared, perhaps, and that's part of the problem. Another part of the problem, I think, well, at least I've read, that the UN believes that if you come down hard on this, you won't get any peacekeepers. No one will send their troops. We don't want to go someplace where there's nobody to play with. You're too hard on our troops. We don't want it. Thanks. So there's, there's a certain sense you can only, de you can only don't demand so much of the troop-contributing countries before they're going to say, nah, it's too hard. So I think, I think those might be two parts of the problem. Maybe you got another idea.
executive power to so forth. And this is not true. The UN is huge. And what the UN does is turn into an entire unit for entire battalions and so forth from one country under the leadership of their own country. And there's nobody at the UN that has any power legally to do something for these people. They're subject to the discipline of their own country. So if the Pakistani army or the Bangladeshi army or the India army or whoever it's from, the Nigerians, they're, 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 they're a lot from Africa. You know, if, if there's someone in our army doing something not disciplining them, there's not a whole lot that the UN as an organization can do. That might make you more cynical about the UN. The UN deserves to be considered. Deserves cynicism, doesn't it? Some, some, some. Not, mm -hmm. not entirely and not as much as people around here tend to give it, but it certainly deserves some. Okay, so those are some ideas about the answer to your question. You might think of some others yourself. Yes, sir. Well, boycott products that you know to have been the result of trafficked labor. Um, it's hard to tell, though. I mean, there are people picking oranges that are trafficked. Most are not. Uh, the same is true with all of our crops. I mean, there are some people out there in the farms working um, to harvest you know, the grapes and the avocados and all that stuff. Now, let me ask you guys, what do you think? What more could be done to... D to Diminish demand for trafficked persons. Do you have a, is this a suggestion? Yes, what? Well, it seems to me like abolition of the UN is apparently necessary to fix the problem. So it seems like if you were to make the same situation that it is now, that it's either five bucks or it's moving to your world, then the lives of the children and the stories and the things that that can bring, and it's not like slave labor. You know, it's funny, uh, now that I think about it, there is something in San Francisco they've experimented with called a John's School, where people accused of soliciting a prostitute can avoid a conviction by going to John's School. It's like driver's school for, for, for bad drivers. And they talk about, you know, abuse of women and injuries and unfairness, and, and, and apparently it's successful at reducing the demand for prostitution in San Francisco. Uh, that that might be a creative idea. Did you have an idea, man? You know, uh, that, uh, that's another education kind of initiative. I once thought that the answer would be to go to a place like Moldova and identify the population of girls that is most likely to be trafficked. And they have a good demographic. They're 18 to 26 years old. They have, you know, a fifth grade education. They're women and, you know, whatever other components they have. And if you went to each one of those people and said, look, you don't need to go to the West we will pay you $100 a month to stay here and, you know, buy goods and services in your community. Maybe we could entice some of them to stay. It might be cheaper than finding them in London after they've been trafficked. Uh, I got shot down on that idea by the International Organization of Migration, IOM. They said, you're restricting their rights to move freely about the world. Okay. Well, that didn't work. Okay, we have like one more minute. If there's another comment, I'll give someone else a chance. Otherwise, we'll let you all go. Ma'am.
that's part of our program. Do, do you need any time to wrap up today, Dave? Uh, I, I don't believe so. I, I will wrap up with my own thoughts. Feel, feel free to interrupt me if anybody else has questions. Okay. Okay, in, in that case then, I thank you all for coming. Uh, I hope you can find some solutions to this problem and uh, spread the word about the bad things that are going on. And uh, if nothing else, have a great night.